Okay, so today it's cleaning day. That's supposed to be see-through, it's just rice, dirt and mud. So we wanted to show you an example of some of the problems that we come across. Um, this is part of the air start system for the T-54. And uh, this section here is essentially the water trap, like any compressor needs. A compressor needs a filter element and a water trap. And what this contains is um, the air comes into this system here and it's plumbed in one end and comes out the top. And essentially this um, fabric filter elements that are stacked inside here and the water get the water in the air system gets pushed to the bottom and then what you do is you you uh, crank this tap open and it allows you to drain the water that builds up inside this so one of the problems that we've had and as you can see in the manual here uh, this represents this unit here these are the the filter elements each one of those is like a felt disc if you will well, due to poor maintenance and uh, it hasn't been addressed, we've pulled the top off the filter element and the filters have become so clogged that that 2000 PSI of air has just blown the, the whole entire center out of the, uh, the filter system. Jesus. So yeah, these have become so clogged that they- blow a hole right through that. Yeah, it's, they've just become clogged, clogged, clogged. And then eventually that pressure buildup has just shot a hole right through the middle of the filter stack. So, so what do we do at this point? So at this point, um, I'm going to pull these filter elements out and you guys can get eyes on. So that's supposed to be like a screen, like see-through, and it's just completely clogged up with, you know, debris and, and dirt and shit. Uh, yeah, this is just, each one of these is supposed to come out together as a disc. And so look at that. Oh, that's um, that's a disposable item. I think we can source some of these from Europe, maybe. Um, but even here, like, it's just turned into mud and rust. And there's a metal screen at the bottom here. I'm hoping that the air hasn't blown a hole through that. It doesn't look like it has. Uh, it turns away from uh, like a stack of filters to like a, like a tube screen. That's supposed to be see-through. It's just rust, dirt, and mud. And, um, if you have a water trap in an air compressor that's blocked, uh, that's going to push water through your whole entire air system and then your air system is going to start rusting. So uh, hopefully, we know there is a leak in it because the bottles aren't holding pressure. Uh, so we'll go through it and see if we can find where the leak is, which is where that flamethrower air compressor we purchased, we'll be able to adapt that and plumb that into the system and without the tank actually running, we can slowly feed air into a pressurizer and we'll be able to listen for where the leak is inside the tank and hopefully it's just a seal or a loose line that we can fix it. One thing to note with these air start tanks, uh, there, is a, there is an electric starter motor which you've seen in some of our walkarounds. It's not good to continually start the tank with that electric starter. It even states in the manual it's, it's for emergency use only. 
Uh, if we continue to just use the electric starter, we'll put so much wear and tear on the engine and the clutch. Uh, it's, it's preferable to have the air start system functioning. Plus, the, the air start's a cool feature of the tank. Um, you know, so it's, it's really the best thing to get it up and running operational. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah, so uh, we've begun needle scaling the turret of the tank. So already from our first video of the T54 online, there has been uh, some trepidation about the origins of this tank. And we're learning more and more as we go through you guys helping us through the comments section, but also things we're finding on the tank. But uh, in terms of our old color scheme, we have this red layer is the base layer here for the Russian primer. And then moving across to this this light green here, that is the Russian base coat. That is the armor standard color of Russian units. Um, this outer layer right here, this is a water-based paint that uh, various museums or whoever has put on here. The interesting thing is we found these shades of like purple, gray, and also tan further up here, as you can see. So they actually are very remnant of from what I can see the Syrian paint scheme that the Syrians used I'm doubtful that this tank came from Syria but I wouldn't rule it out um, if any of you know of any other paint schemes or camouflage patterns out there that involved uh, the, the purple and you can see rather than being striped it's almost applied in like blotches uh, I've never seen this before but it is all over the tank also the remnants of the tan um, so yeah before we strip this off completely we wanted to show you guys evidence of what you find sometimes when you're needle scaling Alright, so we just took the bore evacuator off the T54 and luckily the last guy had it pretty well greased up so that thing came off really easy, uh, almost no heat. You can see all of the moisture and stuff that was trapped inside the bore evacuator. So as part of our checks for the live fire, these are those venturi holes that allow the gas to enter into the bore evacuator. We'll make sure these are all cleared out. The first shot would probably blast all that out in there, but we don't want all that crap filling up the bore evacuator. But a note on the moisture here, you can see the bore evacuator tube itself. There's a little bung right on the bottom side of it. The reason for this is when you're not firing is you crack this and it allows all that moisture to empty out of the bore evacuator. No one did that. Well, no, and you can see the result uh, of the rust and moisture that was uh, <coughs> piled up inside there and it's not too bad though it's really good uh, much easier than our t62 was so just like the t62 we have the venturi jets that once the round reaches right here the build up of pressure in here it allows the pressure to expand into the bore evacuator and then after the shot has left the barrel the built up pressure in here shoots back that way and causes that uh, suction but the Soviet tanks also have like a like a ball bearing on a, a setup kind of here. So I'm not sure my best guess is this is some kind of one way valve that will lift up and allow air to enter the bore evacuator and then it will close again and seal it. Uh, and then that excess gas will build up and only shoot forwards and drive all the gases out of the barrel. Okay, so for those of you that might be wondering these recess points here at the end of the barrel so uh, The barrel is clocked in place. So always the top of the barrel is keyed into a certain spot Each tank has its own way of achieving that but these notches here are uh, For what K 
can be utilized as a bore sight. Uh, some tanks have a special type of tool or sight that you would insert in the front end of it and essentially conduct a bore sight to the tank gun. There's other methods where a round will actually chamber and they can utilize that way. But this method here is a very simple way. And what you do is you run a piece of wire through these notches and you create a crosshair. And then uh, the guy inside will be able to look down the sight and see the exact cross through this and then he can talk to the gunner and actually zero their periscope and telescope off this point. So this is a very old way of doing it, but this is the only way we need to do it. We don't need the fancy sights or any of that. As part of our pre-checks to firing live, we have found a bit of an issue inside the barrel here. You can see on the rifling lands where someone has run a bead of weld um, on four points. Why they did that, I'm not too sure. Maybe they were trying to restore the rifling lands at some point, but that's a, that is an issue for us because this being a 100 millimeter, uh, if the projectile is exiting the barrel and this causes the projectile to wedge, you have an excess buildup of pressure. And uh, if I was to guess, I'd say there's a fair chance the first round may overcome this minimal uh, piece of weld, but we do every single risk mitigation we can to prevent that. So what we're gonna have to do is, is run these weld beads down to be flush with all these other rifling bands here. And before we conduct our first test fire, a projectile will have to fit inside here without any um, obstructions. So that's one of the steps that we take to go live is make sure the barrel is suitable for a round to pass through it. So we're essentially in the process now of upgrading all our main battery electronic lines. Um, this is pretty standard for a lot of our Russian tanks that we do get in. Um, here is the example of the lines that we pulled out of the vehicle. Uh, there's several issues here. Uh, we're big on, you know, obviously safety. So this is just a minefield for uh, electrical hazards. I, I don't even know what's going on here. Um, but you can see the lines are just not um, not too great. Um, even on this line here, you can see some points where this is arced out and burnt itself. Just luckily on the wire braiding, but uh, this is quite an issue. The other issue is the length of these. So the batteries are right behind the driver on his right hand shoulder. And the way that these lines are run, um, the length like this is a huge hazard for the turret in traverse to grab the line, pull on it and essentially shear it and you could potentially cause an electrical fire or at the very least arc out and burn up a lot of your fuses. We're going to make new battery lines right now and we'll show you guys the process. In addition, a pretty cool trick for any Russian tank owners out there, we have a process where um, <clears throat> the vehicle can be slaved, uh, essentially jump started from another vehicle. Being as the most of our vehicles are NATO, you have a standard NATO issue slave lead plug. Uh, the Russian vehicles do not have this. They have a different style of like a two prong connector, which we don't have. So we are adapting a NATO slave lead socket. So we can essentially bring up a 113 or a Humvee or a Leopard and electrically jumpstart our Soviet vehicles through this connection. So we'll show you guys where we mount this as well.
So a cool feature about your heat shrink is you have your positive and negative terminals right here. You can also get a color coded heat shrink. So on one end of your cable, you can label uh, the cable line as well, positive or negative. So now we're inside, uh, right behind the driver, and this is a good chance to show you the difference in, uh, so you have the Soviet style slave lead plug, so another tank would plug into their one, run the vehicle, and then that will plug into this, and this will give the extra juice required to start the vehicle. It's very simple, it just it grounds out and then it runs into your main uh, voltage line. So to adapt the NATO slave lead socket, we're gonna mount this right behind the driver on this box here. And essentially one of these lines is gonna run onto that same point and then the other line will ground out on the tank the same way this does. So that's how we do our NATO slave lead conversion. Then yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead now and run these battery leads. Well, one thing I'm struggling to understand is, um, yes, it's a positive ground tank, but how do they label it? Because ground is ground. Uh, so is the, the negative mark, is that, uh, that's, is that the symbol for negative or ground? you have the negative and the positive. It's a positive ground tank. So you would think there's the grounding point. The grounding point is still labeled ground, even though it's a positive grounded vehicle. So do they do that? So like young guys just joining, uh, they still understand that ground is ground. So everything is still grounded, even though it's a positive ground, the ground is the tank. Uh, I'm not too sure, it is a little bit confusing. Maybe uh, people that have worked on these vehicles um, in the military have a, a better understanding of the electrical system because I still struggle with it. We hooked this up exactly the same way that it came out from the factory. So as long as we follow their schematic, we'll be fine. Okay, so you can see here with the new labels, uh, the new wiring, we have the positive labeled end of the lead on the positive side of the battery. And um, these lead will create a little point for a P-clamp right here. And now with the turret traversing, it's gonna clear all of that. As opposed to before, our lines were three feet long and out here somewhere, and they were kind of just shoved to the side. So we've eliminated the risk of the turret grabbing these and ripping them out. So and it's much neater and easier to figure out new batteries so any reliability with battery issues we've essentially eliminated So we had a couple of viewers ask how we do the K&N air filter mod. Uh, this also might be useful for anyone with a T55 or V55 engine vehicle. 
So think back, you have that big uh, airbox fitting. It's got um, three points being you have two areas for the engine to draw air in. You also have your inline air compressor that draws its air through that filter. And then you have two exhaust ports that essentially create the airflow to do the air filter. So the modification is very simple. We essentially deleted the big box air filter and then you have your air compressor, your intake line, we just put a breather valve on there so the air going into the air compressor is filtered. Then we just adapt your two K and N air filters to the engine air intake. And then down the bottom there, <coughs> That line that you have two lines that run off the exhaust manifold that flow into the air filter, you just loop it. Because without uh, looping this, you'll have an exhaust leak potentially, or also uh, the exhaust does spit a lot of hot fuel and oil. You don't want that spewing down into this area of the engine after we've cleaned it. Uh, and we just have to be cognizant of the teeth on the flywheel not grabbing the line so as long as your line is pulled away from this section here and that's essentially the modification we do here at Battlefield for all of our T55, T62 vehicles and it's just uh, it's easier to maintain it's easier to clean and um, you know it's not original it may affect performance or reliability long term but we only do short vehicle moves so this is this works for us this is totally fine All right, so here's our custom-made hose and gauge setup. So we've adapted to the original Soviet fitting, and then we have a modernized um, airline gauge bleed-off valve. So we have this gauge in PSI, but all the Soviet air gauges are in um, kilogram centimeters squared. So rather than doing the conversion, we also have the PSI rating. So I'm going to hook this up to the compressor. Richie's inside. He's going to hook it in, and let's see if we can find our air leak. So he's going to use soapy water and spray it on all the joints and see if we can find the leak. The soapy water will bubble where there's a leak. Yeah, you're starting to get pressure. Yeah, let me see. So here's our gauge that we've made to slow down the pressure. And then there is the Soviet gauge that originally comes with it. Comes up to our slave lead right here. Top one there. So we have an air leak right here. As you can see, it's uh, bubbling. And that's how you can tell the there's a leak. Alright, we're gonna turn it off and then listen for any air coming out. Hey, I'm turning it off, listen. Alright. Can you hear it? Yeah. How uh, many sore. up? And actually might just be where that connects, so we so have that bottle stem might need a new seal. Yeah, uh, I hear air coming from somewhere here once I figure out where it's coming from. Let you know. Okay, so today it's cleaning day. Uh, we've removed all the paint and now we're going to basically wash the whole entire tank inside and out. And basically, that's going to get us ready for paint prep and then clean the whole interior. This, with the purple power, is excellent for cutting through all the grease because. What happens in that engine bay is things leak like oil and diesel or grease 
uh, and then the heat from the engine, it actually bakes the grease uh, onto the surface and it can be very, very difficult to get it off. So the hot water with that degreaser is excellent for that. For the interior, we wash it for two reasons. The first reason is obviously presentation. We're doing a restoration, so it helps to clean everything. But the most important reason is um, if you have a leak, but all the whole entire engine bay is just covered in oil and fuel, it's very difficult to find that leak. So if we clean everything back to the paint surface, then it allows us to see those uh, paint, uh, those uh, fuel and oil leaks much easier. So that's the main reason why we're doing this. And I think when we got this thing off the truck, we did spot a minor diesel leak. So we need to hot see from, from up underneath through access panels and down through the top and we'll find it once we start running.
So you might be wondering, how the hell did we get from that to this? And I guess to answer that question, you'll just have to stay tuned for our next video.